Uh, I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the foreign policy programs here at the New America Foundation. Thank you all for joining us. We are, uh, it is very, very hard, as uh, uh, anyone in the foreign policy field knows, to sort of change one's frame from being addicted to sort of everything that's playing out on the screens and whatnot in Iran, uh, as I've been, and sort of say, you know, there are other parts of the world that really matter. Uh, and one of the places uh, that our organization has uh, been, been arguing matters a lot more than the Washington, D.C. scene has sort of paid credit to is Russia. Uh, and there are other great international stakeholders as well. And we have a great relationship on many levels with McKinsey and company, uh, but in, in particular through Lenny Mendoza, who's director in the San Francisco office, uh, director of the San Francisco office of McKinsey and, and Company, and leads the firm's knowledge development. Uh, I, I was with another McKinsey guy recently in China that said, you know, anything within the McKinsey email system that says thought or knowledge must be sent uh, to, to Lenny. So I don't know if that's true, but, but uh, it sounded good. Uh, he serves on the Shareholders Council of McKinsey, oversees the firm's communications, uh, including the McKinsey Quarterly and as chairman of the McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, he is a, uh, uh, an outstanding and involved uh, thinker, and he's on the board of directors of the New America Foundation. And in a moment, Lenny Mendoza is going to come up uh, and help introduce today's program and the important report uh, titled Lean Russia, Sustaining Economic Growth Through Improved Productivity. Uh, which is being released today. Uh, let me make a quick comment about the report, which you don't have in your hands. The box apparently hasn't arrived, but we will have it downloadable immediately on uh, our various sites. There are a lot of people watching live right now on the New America Foundation website uh, and also at the Washington Note. So you'll be able to get the full report and executive summary uh, that way. And after the presentation on the report, uh, we've asked uh, Doug Redeker, who's director of the Global Strategic Finance Initiative here at the New America Foundation, someone who's been writing and thinking about uh, state capitalism and, and the sort of new features of the evolving international economic order, uh, also has significant experience in Eastern Europe and Russia. Um, uh, and and uh, really global finance will be sharing. And then Toby Gatti, uh, who's a senior international advisor at Aiken Gump, uh, she focuses on political, economic, and trade developments in Russia, the newly independent states, former Soviet Union, and so on, and was special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia, uh, Ukraine, and the Eurasian states at the National Security Council in the White House in 1993. So we've got a great team to offer some response to the report, and then I'll help moderate a fun discussion afterwards. So without further ado, please welcome Lenny Mendoza. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you here today and have a chance to introduce my colleague in just a moment. I want to give you a little bit of background on the McKinsey Global Institute and how we do these kinds of reports. Uh, the Global Institute was founded almost 20 years ago now, and our researchers have conducted dozens of studies on the develop and developing world spanning four continents and 28 industry sectors. They're pretty big research efforts. Uh, to give you a sense of a scope, a typical study for a country like we're talking about today would take a full-time research team of about 10 people. And, and they'd spend that time doing a bunch of research, primary research, and interviewing in excess of uh, 400 companies as part of that. These country studies draw on uh, McKinsey's micro to macro approach, where we assess the productivity, performance, and competitiveness of countries uh, and their sectors, industry sectors, relative to global benchmarks. We then build on McKinsey's industry expertise and it com that in which that looks at the ways companies operate around the globe to help explain how managerial decisions and industry dynamics lead to industry and economy-wide um, outcomes. And I'm pleased today to have and introduce you to Yermolai Solzhenitsyn, who co-led the latest MGI productivity study on Russia as part of a joint venture with McKinsey's Moscow office, where Yermolai is a director. Uh, Yermolai has worked with Russian and international companies for over a decade on topics of strategy, M&A, organization, and operational improvements in industry sectors as broad as metals and mining, petroleum, and transportation. Prior to joining McKinsey, Yermolai lived and worked in Taiwan and China for several years, and he was brought up and educated here in the United States. I should note that this is McKinsey's second productivity study on Russia, and let me say what a, a difference a decade makes. In 1999, when we first published our work on Russia, Russia had just ended the long economic decline following the collapse of the Soviet Union. The country had defaulted in August 1998, and the ruble had plummeted. Russia's GDP had fallen by more than 40 percent in eight years, and capacity utilization had plunged to less than 50 percent. 
Before the global downturn took hold, Russia appeared to have undergone a substantial economic transformation since the late 1990s. Much of the economic growth in that decade was relatively easy. Growth is never easy, but it was relatively easy. The economy was expanding by using idle production capacity and positive demographic trends helped. Our research that Yermolai will talk about in a moment argues that Russia's future growth is going to need to come from new investment and higher productivity, making more and better use of existing labor and capital resources. Let me hand it over to Yermolai. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I won't apologize for my uh, American pronunciation because in a way I've uh, uh, lived for 16 years here. But the uh, last 10 years, as Lenny mentioned, I've been living in Russia and uh, grew up kind of always in a Russian household. Um, so I, I, one of the things that I find quite interesting and important in, in our work in Russia is to also help to bring our perspective on what's going on in the country going you know, one level below let's say, the many stereotypes that exist. I mean, I think Russia is a country which has very, very, for obvious reasons, very many stereotypes associated with it, uh, from the Soviet period to the last 20 years. And uh, maybe in, during the discussion today, hopefully we can dig, dig a bit below, below some of those. Um, so I will, let's, uh, we will launch into the report. I, you know, Steve, please, if I get a bit too in, in the details or something, you, I'm going too slow, you accelerate me so we make sure we have a good All right. Um, Three sections. Uh, first, I want to just talk a little bit about where Russia is today, broadly speaking, on this whole question of economic efficiency and uh, through the prism of predominantly labor productivity, although we'll also talk about capital. A little bit about what we've done the last decade and where we need to go over the next 10 years. Um, the report is based on a deep dive me method, as Lenny mentioned. We looked in depth at five sectors of the economy, so we'll talk a bit about some of the insights coming specifically to those industries. And then, you know, to summarize around what are some of the things that we believe the government in Russia should do, but also what are some of the, the things other actors in the society, in the economy need to do. Well, first, uh, first uh, observation is that Russia over the past decade um, basically, doubled, basically doubled its uh, uh, per capita GDP levels. Um, which is, you know, no small achievement, um, and uh, it's something that has certainly made Russia today a country which people speak of sometimes with optimism, sometimes with suspicion. But generally, you hear people saying, look, Russia is a force to be reckoned with. If you just wind the clock back to the 90s, uh, it was a much more of Russia is a basket case, or Russia is, uh, uh, you know, the cradle of a new democracy we have to build. But certainly the word strength or the word uh, something to be reckoned with was not there. It completely collapsed off the, 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 the Cold War parity where it was. So th this is a very important thing to consider, that over 10 years the uh, GDP doubled. Now, wh how, how did it grow? Um, actually, you know, a good two-thirds, if not more of that, was labor productivity growth. Um, Russian labor productivity um, uh, you know, there, there, there was also workforce growth, um, something that uh, we will not have in the future. But generally, the Russian worker was able to produce more in, by 2007 than he was in 1997. What happened? Well, this is a very important uh, picture. Essentially, Russia has been using, over the last 10 years, the inheritance that it received from preceding generations. So the capital base of the country, the infrastructural base of the country, the even educational system of the country, it goes broader, the health system. A lot of the kind of society forming systems were basically still fairly in okay shape and kind of lasted through the 15 years or 20 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So for, for example, if you see on the left, um, the total capacity utilization of all the manufacturing and production assets in the country was in 1998-2000 down at like 45 to 50 percent. Part of this was that the Soviet economy was producing at a level that was, you know, it was, it was not market-oriented. It was just more plan-oriented. Plan Part of it was, uh, of course, that the GDP in the country collapsed. But over this decade, we started going up, up, up to, you know, essentially levels of 80, 85 percent, which, again, depending on the industry, is pretty close, getting pretty close to capacity. 
This is true for metal plants. This is true for oil fields. This is true for housing stock. This is true for, in general, for the country. The country grew in. It's almost like you were wearing a suit, and then kind of you suddenly shrunk. And then over a certain period, you started growing again. In those 10 years, you're kind of fitting in that suit. But it's getting a bit out of fashion. It's a bit old. It's, a bit, uh, it's getting ripped a bit in some places. And, and you know, Russia grew into that now. But now, of course, we kind of we basically need, need, need a new suit. Then we have uh, the working force population. This, this is another workforce. This is another important factor. Russia, as many of you know, has a demographic challenge ahead. Uh, the population is declining for uh, reasons we can um, elaborate on. What is even more relevant for this discussion is the labor force is going to lose by estimates that are, you know, various estimates in the Russian society by 10 million people out of a total of about 75. So we have a pretty rapid contraction of the labor force ahead. This has to do basically with the fact that in the early 90s, uh, people stopped uh, giving, um, you know, the birth rate went down significantly. So in the last 10 years, we were able to grow into the capacity and we were able to grow into, we had some excess labor available. Both of those things going forward are by definition, no longer there. We can talk a little bit about the crisis and how that's impacted it, but fundamentally we believe it's essentially a short-term impact for this discussion, and the challenges that uh, we're talking about will remain, although they may get shifted by a couple of years. Now, in 2000, Russian government proposed more like a slogan, more like a, more like a rallying call that, you know, let's double GDP. And there was discussion about, you know, how fast we can double it. Well, you know, in the end, we basically doubled it in about 11 years or maybe even less. Uh, looking forward, uh, the government has re repeated this call. I mean, it's not too imaginative, but on the other hand, it's simple math. You know, people get it. Let's double it again. This was pre-crisis, th this discussion, but we just decided that it would be interesting to put in perspective. What would that mean? Well, first of all, that would mean for Russia at 13,000 uh, per capita GDP to double uh, if you wanted to get to it at 2020, which was the original target state, you'd have to grow labor productivity at 5% uh, per annum. You'd, uh, if you were to do that, you know, you, you would be, 2007, 2020, you'd be reaching that in 13 years. As you look to the left, I want to go into every detail on this chart. Essentially, very few countries have ever, ever been able to achieve a doubling from, you know, a level of 15 to $30,000 uh, dollars in such a short time. And mostly the record of U.S., Germany, Britain, Canada, Japan, Australia, that stage of their development, it took them almost three decades. Now, on the other hand, you could say, look, history leapfrogs. We're at a different stage of economic development. Communications, information technology, uh, the availability in general of industrial technologies, it's a different era. Question is, will Russia actually move strongly in that direction? And, and, and uh, if so, what does it have to do to do that? Well, it's always easier to grow when you're starting from a low base. Uh, so R Russia is starting from a low base. Um, our uh, labor productivity is basically at, for the sectors we analyze in this report, 26% of the U.S. levels. Um, for the economy as a whole, it's 31%. But, you know, a quarter to, you know, more than, more, uh, below a third of U.S. levels. Why U.S. is just a convenient benchmark which we use in, 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 in this research. Um, now, you know, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, very, you know, there's countries that have lower labor productivity than, than, than GDP per employee than the United States that have great standards of living, and it's, it's, not, a, it's not a problem uh, necessarily. For instance, Sweden is, uh, you know, at $78,000, uh, um, it's, it's about 80% of U.S. levels. It's, it's uh, also a very good society to live in, but Russia is, as we say, on average on 30. Now, the five sectors we looked at, we'll go briefly into them show that, you know, it's kind of a consistent picture across the economy. There are, however, important differences about why steel or why retail are higher than electric power or construction that I wanted to share with you today. So, again, just so you understand, this is the index, so this is exactly the percentage of, of the productivity. Now, again, why is it important for a country which has a declining labor force? It is a crucial question. It is a crucial question because if you have declining labor force and you're stuck at a certain level of labor productivity, you just by definition cannot grow. Now, you can put some more capital in and so on, but I mean still fundamentally you, you've got a bottleneck. Now, what a shame it would be if everything else was good. Let's assume that all the conditions were ripe for growth, but you, you hit this demographic and productivity bottleneck. Uh, 
Now, the other solution is immigration. Other solutions immigration, it's, a, it's a, many of the people who naturally would have come back to the Russian labor market from some of the former Soviet republics, as they used to be called, uh, have already done so. Um, Russia is not the easiest place for people to move to and settle. Um, so that, that, that challenge, that, that source of, let's say, growth of the labor force uh, is uh, not certain at all. Just to put it in perspective, when we're doing this research, everybody was asking us, well, what about the other BRICS? And, you know, the fact is that uh, actually Russia, here, surprise, Russia has the higher labor productivity of all the BRICS. Um, now, it has something to do with the structure of the economy. Russia, in general, has an advanced kind of a more like a developed market type of economy. Just as a proxy, the share of urban population, um, you know, the, Russia and Brazil are significantly higher share of urban population than uh, China and India. Um, generally, again, you know, agricultural labor moves to the cities as an increase in the productivity of um, productive industries. But it's important to keep in mind that you know, this is not an absolute catastrophe that Russia is at 30 percent. You know, China is at 10. Okay, we know they're very big. Brazil, though, Brazil is uh, 190 million people, so it's comparable to Russia's 140. And it's kind of roughly, r roughly there. So it, it, it's still sort of in this group. Um, but nonetheless, that, that, that is the base we're starting from. So it's a kind of a low base shared with other BRICS. The second big theme is that Russia, which I mentioned already, has not been investing in that suit, right? It has not been upgrading the infrastructure, which is an absolute requirement for any society to function, more, more, moreover, to function well. Over the last decade, uh, Russia was investing under 20% of GDP uh, as uh, investments into the fixed assets base. You see in that period, China was investing 40%. But it's a completely different paradigm. So therefore, of course, I was being slightly, you know, provocative saying that, you know, we're higher than the other BRICS because this is a big problem. Because the idea with BRICS is that they're modernizing, they're building, they're putting in the latest technology, and in five, ten years, they're going to have the most modern asset base. It's going to be more modern than Europe or America. Again, by definition, because you need to rebuild everything. Russia hasn't yet done so. There's good news and bad news in that. So the bad news, of course, is that we have a very, again, dilapidated infrastructural system. The good news is that we haven't screwed it up yet, right? So, I mean, the question is, how are we going to really take it forward? Now, again, just as a proxy, if we were to say that we had to get to this level of doubling uh, GDP by 2020, we'd be, need to invest something like 30% of uh, GDP in investments. Uh, we need to invest 30%. Now, this makes it really critical. So on the other hand, you have to say where to get the money from, but, you know, let, let, let's, let's assume the money is there. The importance of how well you build, we'll talk about this a little bit later, becomes paramount. Um, and, and, and here, you know, you have on the right side of this exhibit some very, very disturbing facts. Um, in Russia, it takes, you know, it's 30% more expensive to build, let's say, a power plant than in European Union. Europe, which is much more strict safety codes, environmental codes, labor regulations. I'm not even talking about China. I mean, China, four times more. And this is not just, again, because, uh, uh, because uh, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole set of factors. These factors have to do with, A, being out of practice. If you don't build for the last 20 years, you don't know how to do it. And many of the companies we work with, the biggest headache they had before the crisis was, how do I actually build my new mine, my new plant, my new pipeline? Who will be the people who will be building? Because we already started feeling this labor shortage. And who will be the project managers? Because how, how the hell do you build this thing? No, nobody knows. They remember how they built it in the 80s. And that's another thing that Russia says, we have a great tradition of doing this or that. It's essentially a tradition that is, it was very strong, but its roots are in the 80s, 70s and 80s. So when Russia rolls out, let's say, a new car model or a plane model, until recently, but during the 90s and the early part of the last decade, of uh, this decade, this is the 80s designs. No one's been thinking about that. Construction cost of a distribution center, just an example. I mean, what's a distribution center? It's a box, right, with some kind of ramps, and, you know, it's, it's a basic thing. This is not very sophisticated. It's more expensive, 30% more expensive in Moscow than London. Why? We'll talk about why in a bit. So in the first section, just to summarize, we have pluses and minuses, strengths and challenges. On the one hand, we grew, double GDP. We grew. And, uh, you know, a portion of that certainly is attributable to 
uh, the, let's say, energy boom and the high commodity prices and the oil prices. Um, but uh, uh, by all means, the, the fact is that, again, the economy was able to deliver uh, twice as much, let's say, output per worker than it was before. So, you know, you translate the, the mana that falls from heaven, you could translate it in different ways. Um, and uh, Russia certainly uh, has chosen on the one period to really feed that into the economy and later to sequester it. So a lot of the money coming from oil actually wasn't going into the economy, which allowed Russia to accumulate over the $600 billion of uh, uh, reserves, which they've, you know, with various degree of success used over the last, let's say, year to kind of stabilize the situation, but actually have, you know, avoided some of the more drastic, dramatic scenarios of, of the banking crisis. So you have, this, you have this great growth. On the other hand, you have a situation where we didn't invest in our society. I'm not talking here in this report about the complete the underinvestment, education, health, other elements of infrastructure. We didn't look here at transport. Um, you know, we were just in New York. Uh, I was in New York last week with uh, my family, and my, my son says, Dad, I mean, it's amazing. There's no traffic jams in New York. <laughs> it's like, it's like he, was, he was completely right. Compared to Moscow, where it take you three hours to get from the airport. So the, the road infrastructure, that, that, that challenge uh, is, is a massive one. And as I think many studies have pointed out, transportation infrastructure can influence quite significantly the uh, growth of the economy. So we have that challenge uh, of, of uh, 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 dilapidated infrastructure and how are we going to um, move, move forward with that. Well, let's, for some of the lessons about why we have this gap and what to do about it, let's look at the sectors. And I, I will try not to worry too much. First of all, just to, just to review, we looked at sectors which essentially account for or are representative of about 50% of Russia's GDP. So the sectors we looked at on, on the right side here is electricity generation, distribution, residential construction, uh, retail trade, uh, retail banking, uh, and steel. So again, while not in themselves covering uh, the 50% of Russia's GDP, you know, they're representative of manufacturing services, wholesale retail, utilities, and so on. By the way, while I'm on this chart, I just wanted to say one thing. To those of you who follow Russia closely, uh, you will know that there's a lot of discussion in Russia about that we need to become, a, we need to become an innovative economy, that we need to somehow maybe do some nano, nano solutions, that we need to... Uh, we need to find some new, 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 parent, new, new answers. This is our economy. For the next 15 years, you know, it's basically going to be a, a lot around minerals and manufacturing. So I think it's important to keep in mind that this is the base we have to work on. I'm getting a little note to speed up, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, again, to put it in perspective, if we wanted to achieve that goal of doubling the GDP by 2020, you kind of have to, well, but pretty much by definition, you kind of have to pretty much have to double the uh, labor productivity over that period. Now, where would that leave Russia? It would leave it around half, maybe a little bit below half of U.S. levels. Nothing too shocking, really. I was talking to a guy in the Russian railroad system. He said, you know, we were, we were in Florida looking at a rail depot. And he goes, frankly, I was sitting there, and the guy was sitting there watching this guy sitting there smoking a cigar kind of giving orders about, you know, which, which direction, which wagons would go. He goes, it didn't really appear to be too productive. He's like, we can't be that far behind. Well, you know, we are. But nonetheless, again, it should be half of U.S. levels should be attainable. And to give credit, again, you see in some of the industries that Russia was able to do that over the last decade. Um, okay, a little bit on different sectors. Retail, interesting fact. An important factor of productivity in retail is the formats. Right? So a traditional open-air market or a corner store just simply makes less money per square meter than a more modern format. In Russia, you see shaded in the bottom here, the share of these large formats has been growing. Uh, where at the beginning of the last decade, you know, small stores basically had 50% you know, of all the sales to, in all the retail in Russia was these small corner stores. Probably something like America back in, I don't know when exactly, I won't, I won't guess, but it's a trend that many countries have seen. This is a very important factor because 40% uh, or more than half of the gap, actually, in the retail productivity is the share of the large formats for Russia. <laughs> There's another good story here, which is that actually those large formats are not quite there. The share is not that high, but the demand is going to be huge. Russia is very underpenetrated. So the square meters of modern format retail space per citizen, even in Moscow, St. Petersburg, is essentially three to three and a half times below European averages. So again, those of you that go to Moscow might say, wow, there's malls everywhere. Even in Moscow, they're not nearly penetrated to the degree. So that, that's good news. So by building these formats, we, we will raise our productivity. That's unlocking economic growth. Here is a very uh, interesting uh, fact. 
in general, the productivity in these modern formats, $1,000 per employee, it's not lagging that much behind America. It's, it's uh, well, 20%, but, you know, that's, it's in the same ballpark. The interesting thing is that the markups, the gross profit as a percent of revenue, estimated to be relatively similar to the U.S. Employees are still three times more. So employees per sales area, three times more. Answer, why, how can this work for now? The sales revenue is double. That's another interesting fact for you. In Russian modern formats, a square meter generates double the money that it does in America. And again, it's not prices. It's not a jack up on the margins. What it is, is actually the underpenetration. What it is, is that you just got crowds going through this thing, through these shopping malls, because of the unsatisfied demand. I mean, again, you look around the United States, there's a Walmart on every single exit. That's just not like that yet. So what does that mean? On the one hand, good, there's a growth opportunity. On the other, as these penetration grows, that revenue per thousand, that money per square meter is going to go down. We've got a problem back, back in the productivity area, right? Because we're, we're going to still need to fight this employees. Let me just focus on maybe some other issue facts. Retail banking. Okay, it's, it's low on retail banking. Important point. This is another theme. 50% of the gap, it's 75% it's, it's of the gap in the banking sector has got to do just about how the companies are, or the banks are organized. It's got not, nothing to do with any structural factor, with the weather, with the culture, with the genes. It has to do with how we organize the work processes. Here, here's an example for you. A cash withdrawal in Russia, on average, takes six to eight minutes. If you go to a bank to get cash out. I mean, we're not talking about ATMs here. 1.5 minutes in the States. Again, no one goes to get, withdraw cash anymore at the bank, but if they did, it was going to be 1.5 minutes when it was this time. Um, cash deposit, similar story. Now, what's interesting is it's different between different Russian banks. You can't just say, well, the regulation system is like this. Some are better than others. But regulations... The United States has one report you've got to submit as a bank to the Federal Reserve System every 15 days. It's one form. They kind of use it in different ways, but it's one form. Russia has 74 different reports you have to submit to banking authorities. And this is not done through some evil design, you know. This is just, just the way it is because, you know, people who work in the regulatory organs create jobs for themselves. Um, <laughs> construction. Uh, again, just a few tidbits on construction. Half, again, has got to do with how things are organized, how the workers are organized. The construction, one Russian worker, mostly it's not Russian, it's from kind of, you know, neighboring countries. One worker one f does, does five times less than an American worker. And there are some factors, like small, single-family homes are actually more productive to build than large ones. Russia's got a very low share. The, most of it is the organization. Now, again, growth. People say, how? If our productivity is four times less, we're going to have to fire people. Where are they going to go and get jobs? Well, retail is going to grow. Banking is going to grow. Construction, I won't get into details now, just in the interest of time. We need to double our housing stock to get to uh, the levels that uh, the government believes is appropriate for, for the people. In Russia, those of you know, there's a shortage of housing stock. It impacts labor mobility as well. So it's very important. There's growth, but how are we going to enter that growth? Here, this is horrible. So time required to get construction permits. Actually, it's 700 days is how much you need to get all the paperwork to build. Now, by law, it's actually more like 900 days, but, you know, your people on average are able to get to about 700. U.S. is 40 days. Canada is 75. Even Ukraine, which is notorious for, let's say, obstacles and, and so on, um, much better. So what does that mean? That means the competition in construction industry is not about who builds cheaper. It's about who has the connections or pay, makes the payoffs to get this uh, permits. And as a result, what do you have? There's no pressure. There's, no, there's not enough competition. You have very high prices of housing. The, at purchasing power parity, Russian housing is more expensive than Germany, Sweden, UK, US, Hungary. Now, again, people don't earn that much money. This just doesn't fit. So how, how, how are we going to solve that? Labor cost is less. Steel price is less. There's no economically driven rationale why the housing should be so expensive. Now, the reason is, of course, supply is rather tightly controlled. It's all about who has the access to get the right permits. And, you know, you talk to them and say, what's the point for me to cut $50 off the cost of a square meter? When it's all really, the game is a completely different area. Um, electricity, again, the only thing I'll say here, s you know, 70% of the difference, more, it's about how we're organized. It's not about technological solutions. It's around how the systems and the processes are organized. We broke down this question. The big question of electricity is building. So we need to build all of this. 
some of this gap is around standardization. Some of this is around procurement efficiency. Probably a good 25% is basically around administrative barriers and, you know, basically corruption. Um, and everybody, you know, everybody knows that. Um, it's probably true in a lot of different economies. But again, if we're going to now rebuild the national infrastructure with this efficiency, we will charge the population and the companies the price per unit of rail shipment, the price per unit of electricity, the price per unit of gas to reflect this full cost. So then we will lock ourselves in in the next generation into a higher cost structure than we should. So as I said the good news is we haven't messed it up yet, but we really gotta we really gotta pay attention. Steel's better. Steel is uh, higher among the top players. And, and what I would say here is interesting. What trends do you see? Well, steel has been privatized for a long time. So when you had private, let's say, owners focusing on their plants, the better ones are getting quite respectable levels. Retail was the highest labor productivity. Well, retail has had a lot of international competition. There's a lot of international formats in Russia. This brings in best practice. It creates, it creates pressure, creates visibility. It allows for choice. That has also helped. Electricity is only now beginning to be reformed. It's lower. So more competition, more access to international best practice are things that clearly have a correlation um, with, um, with uh, efficiency. Here's just a scary picture for you that I, uh, on steel I wanted to put in. Just, just, this is amazing. This, this kind of stuff doesn't happen in peacetime. Right? And on the left, you see two curves. The, cur the top line there is what should have been the steel consumption in Russia reflecting the fall of GDP. The bottom, the more light blue columns, is what it was. Right? So, of course, you can see also today's crisis. You know, global steel consumption goes down 30%. GDP is, you know, whatever, 5 to 10. People postpone postpone construction. All of that was underinvested. This just gives you the scale. 300 million tons of steel should have been put in the system that weren't. And the, uh, according to accounting standards, uh, basically 30% uh, of Russia's uh, assets are fully depreciated. So, to sum up, as Lenny mentioned, we looked in 1999 at a lot of these factors. In 1999, we said, here's seven barriers that we need to tackle. Unequal taxation, selective approach in, by the government and subsidies, bureaucracy, basically, underdeveloped infrastructure, low labor mobility, because, again, to move people from one sector to the other, they have to be able to move, a banking system that has to be more efficient, and, and lack of management skills. I think as we look over this last decade, we can say that you know, four of the seven have been addressed to some degree. We probably still have a problem with bureaucracy and you know, associated transaction costs. We have underdeveloped physical and social infrastructure. It, it's been declared as a priority now, but you know, that's when the oil price tanked, so we'll, let's see how things go. Uh, and low labor mobility. Th this hasn't really, really worked. Um, so we still have to tackle those, those areas. And I think just, just a couple more slides, but just very briefly, we believe the main cause for the productivity gap, actually, has, is, is two things. I mean, one is the favorable market conditions. When the going was good, why bother? Right? If you can make money anyway when you know, things are booming, eh, the, the pressure to enhance productivity is less. And the second was, again, non-level playing field. So if there's not enough competition in some sectors, you can achieve success simply by kind of just guaranteeing your market share through other ways. Now, we, we talked about regulatory barriers, one other just concrete thing for those of you who are uh, maybe in this area. Russia has a very underdeveloped system of urban planning and master planning, and zoning doesn't even exist. So one of the reasons why costs are so high in, the, in construction and why, it is, and why housing is so expensive is people are trying to, they don't know what's going to happen next door. You build an elite residential kind of you know, housing complex, and next door somebody's going to open some garbage dump. It's going to completely impact your, your, your values. There is none of that system yet. So people try to put the money in to the price up front to cover some of those risks. So the government, I mean, there's a lot of different things that I don't think that, you know, you in Washington probably know everything the government can do to kind of, you know, ensure transparency and uh, uh, focus on efficiency. Certainly Russia has a lot to learn from the business world in, in, in its public sector about how to enhance transparency in the, in the government and to enhance uh, international companies and international experts to work in Russia. It needs to do that. Um, as, as, as we mentioned, that there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that the government needs to do in structural change and urban development. But a lot, and this is an important message I will conclude with, a lot is in the hands of companies. 
between 35 to 60 percent of the gap, depending on the sector, had to do with just the way the company is organized, just the way the industry is organized. It's internal, internal reasons. They do not require capex to fix. This is not outdated technology. This is just the way you're organized. Um, and uh, uh, we did a panel of eight Russian CEOs. We talked, we talked to us this presentation, and we had a discussion. And we said, okay, guys, who of you thinks that in two years you can double productivity in your company? Forget the external you know, environment. Like you, do you see where it is? Do you know how to do it? And I think seven of the eight raised their hands. That doesn't mean they will. It doesn't really mean they can. But it means that when they kind of thought about it, they thought that it wasn't that complicated. So our hope would be that, um, our hope would be that business would also tackle uh, these things that has a lot to do about education, has a lot to do about business culture. Um, and uh, we fundamentally, as a result of this research, feel that the good news is that you know, there is so much opportunity for Russia to come out of this low base effectively. It's pretty clear which way to go. They're not magical solutions. They're not high tech. It's around organizing yourself normally. Will we be able to do it or not? Will depend on a lot of factors. We truly hope, and I, I truly hope, uh, being a Russian, that uh, we will. It should, it should help, uh, help the whole region and, and probably the world at large. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Let me invite uh, the folks to bring their chairs over, and let me invite um, Toby Gatti to start off with a uh, response, uh, followed by Doug Redeker. Thank you. Um, I think this report is uh, very correct in its assumptions, um, talking about the fact that the past sources of growth don't exist anymore and that the new environment requires new responses. Uh, that's especially obvious uh, since the financial crisis. I think it's also correct to say that many of the changes required um, could be undertaken, should be undertaken. Of course, the question is, will they be undertaken? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, and I think a study like this makes um, a huge contribution, particularly because it's not the first. So you can go back and look at 1999 and say, uh, where, um, where was Russia, where is Russia, and then hopefully where will Russia be going. Um, but my experience is not uh, in um, productivity or efficiency. Uh, I'm a political scientist, and government is not known for being uh, having as its goal uh, efficiency, and even if it does, it rarely um, meets that goal. And so what I want to do is talk about some of the factors um, that were mentioned um, in the presentation, but uh, really dwell on them because I think they really are going to be the um, important factors for determining whether or not those uh, eight Russian businessmen uh, can actually do what they uh, say they can do, even though they own their businesses and theoretically they should be able to do it, right? Um, I think it can't be assumed that um, the problems in Russia are economic problems, totally. I think uh, in uh, many of the cases they are political, they're social, um, uh, they're um, a question of what the vision of Russia is for the future uh, among the elite. And it can't be assumed that businessmen and political leaders share the same uh, vision, um, um, increasing uh, productivity um, may be important to certain businessmen, not to others. Uh, depends where they're located, what their relationship is to the people in their town or their region, and certainly political leaders have other considerations. I think you have to um, also keep in mind that while um, what's been dealt with in the report talks about 50 percent of the economy, there's another 50 percent. And if that 50 percent is working in the opposite direction, it's going to be very hard to do some of the changes that are required. For example, the uh, growth of Russian state corporations uh, in the last couple of years. Um, huge parts of the Russian economy given over to uh, basically um, not businessmen, I'll put it that way, um, uh, who had them. And um, uh, those parts of the economy uh, uh, don't, don't operate under the same rules as the private sector does. A new Russian strategic sectors law, which will 
discourage uh, or could discourage investment in uh, foreign direct investment in Russia will make a difference because the best practices and the um, uh, um, the experience uh, of the West will not be available. The fact that a lot of towns uh, in Russia uh, have one industry makes a big difference. If you have one industry, you don't have the luxury of saying, well, I think I'll close it and, you know, kind of we'll figure out later what you guys do for the next year uh, to feed your families. Um, the withdrawal from the WTO, which uh, uh, nobody has a good handle on why or what the impact might be, but it certainly isn't going to increase the presence of um, uh, and the, in, uh, the impact of international norms and standards on Russia. So all those things matter. Um, so my, my comments were really going to focus on um, uh, the problems, uh, not, that, not, not problems that aren't known. Uh, I think every one of the issues that's been discussed here has been raised by the political leadership. Uh, Russia doesn't have a political leadership that um, goes around telling the world that the economy is great. Um, as early as um, uh, the beginning of President Putin's uh, time in office, he talked about the, uh, how business should behave, um, uh, the need for business to focus on business and do what it does best and not focus on politics. And yet we have a system now in Russia where um, business and politics are perhaps more linked uh, and closer than they've ever been. Um, we need, uh, we have a political leadership that has spoken many times about the need to decrease reliance on the energy sector and to diversify the economy, and yet we have a, a, um, a state budget that relies on the revenues um, um, for the price of, uh, and that depends on the price of oil. Um, we have um, four national priorities which were outlined and put under um, uh, Medvedev's um, responsibility, health, education, housing, agriculture. And that was supposed to lead to major advances in the, some of the areas that you talked about. It's hard to have productivity um, if the average life of a man is 59 or 60 years old. There's a lot of years that you're just not around. Now, it's true you don't collect your pension, so you can think of the good side. But uh, it also means that you're... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, um, couldn't resist that. Um, we, uh, you've had leaders talk about the need to develop small and medium businesses, and we hear about that all the time, and yet we have an economy in Russia that has not done that. Uh, the need to develop innovation and high tech, um, one of the four I's that uh, Medvedev talked about, innovation, institutions, infrastructure, investment. Um, and now, of course, you have the fight against corruption which is uh, very important uh, to the new president. So I think if you're going to look at the future, um, you have to examine why actions outlined by the leadership were not taken. And you have to ask, I think, here, not only what good will come from making the changes that were outlined um, and ask who benefits, but I always found out in uh, Russia you have to ask who's hurt by a change but also who benefits from the status quo. And uh, when you think of it that way, you can see a lot of groups that benefit from a status quo, from uh, mayors of city who are used to the way things um, uh, are organized, uh, local officials who know where to go when they want the soccer team supported or themselves, um, and the local bureaucracy, which has a, a rule book that they can always walk in and say, well, if you don't do what, what you're supposed to, and if you don't um, uh, adhere to, you know, Regulation 9,412, we're going to close you down. Um, you have um, uh, governors who are uh, beholden now to Moscow and not to their local population, so they really are not necessarily looking to their local situation for approval, but looking to Moscow. And you have to confront suspicions, which still exist among the population, that businessmen are um, there to rip the public off. Uh, a survey done last year talked about, asked people what was the best economic system for Russia, and 15% said that a market economy was, 24% said that a planned economy was, and 47 uh, set, percent said that a mixed economy was. I can't imagine that in a crisis situation those numbers haven't moved a lot more towards the state sector, just as they have in the United States, by the way. Um, 
And of course, the way things are organized is not uh, random. Um, some of these rules were put in place for a reason. The reason was not to um, have increased efficiency, it was to have increased control and uh, control by bureaucrats. So it wasn't just a question of um, uh, um, um, maximizing um, efficiency by closing plants. Kudrin, Kudrin, the most liberal uh, of the top leaders, was asked in Vermasti in an interview whether the government would support uh, Oftavaz, the large car rent manufacturer. This is an interview either yesterday or today, I forget. And, he's, and he was asked, would that money continue to come from the budget? Because you don't have as much money the next year. And his answer was that it is a city-forming enterprise, and its shutdown would lead to serious social consequences. And the interviewer said, so there's no other reason to keep it open? He said, no. It, it's a quote, no. If the budget did not help, no one would help. Budget support is the only possible solution for Oftavaz. 100,000 people work there. And he's correct. That is the only solution. But it's not an efficient solution, and it doesn't mean people are going to buy those cars instead of the Ford, uh, that if they can. So I think you know you have to ask these kind of questions and then put the recommendations in that um, in that context. Um, I think if you look back, um, you have to say why weren't the changes made that uh, were listed um, in this chart. And I think one, I want to focus on two or three issues. Some are big, some are small. Um, the big ones are let's get this um, corruption. And I say that's on everyone's mind because it's on Medvedev's mind. Not that it wouldn't be on everyone's mind anyway, but they wouldn't be talking about it as much. Um, the report is very polite. You have figured out about 20 different ways of saying corruption without, without saying. I'm going to be the speed up guy. Thank you. Um, and um, only once does it talk about what corruption actually does. So I'll leave that because I think most of you who've been in Russia or read about Russia know what corruption does. Another issue is the size of the state bureaucracy. Um, it was once a study done that said the more uh, deputy ministers you have, the more corruption there is. Just there are more people with their hands out. And the size of the state bureaucracy in Russia has grown 40% uh, um, in five years. And some people estimate that it's 10 or more percent of the economy. I also I mentioned state corporations, um, so that's a big issue, a smaller issue, but not really. Qualified personnel. Um, our law firm has an office in Moscow and has unbelievably qualified people. I mean, they are spectacular. They are, I, won't, I can't say it because I'm in Washington, but some of them are smarter than the people who are here. Um, <laughs> And, and a lot of the business, and they often go in, then into business. They'll be hired by a company, and they'll become the legal counsel for huge, huge companies. But the number is small, and um, you know anyone who knows people who are in Russian higher education uh, knows that uh, grades, degrees can be bought, which may not matter if you're, you know, drawing pictures, but it might matter if you're a heart surgeon. Um, um, the most popular career today in Russia is. Where do people want to go? The tax inspectorate. Now, I don't think it's because people love taxes. Um, and also Gazprom employees, that's also a good one. Um, a couple of years ago, it was the FSB. We know why, because uh, of Putin. In the 1990s, it was business. Um, residential construction, all I'll say is that land is a commodity that people can control bureaucrats can control and they want to continue to do that and if you've ever talked to a russian about getting hooked up to the gas lines in areas where it's not easily done you'll get a whole uh, 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 eye opener about how uh, that works russia today has fewer roads fewer kilometers of roads than it had in the year 2000 during a period when china has built from 50 to 60,000 kilometers of new roads. So that's amazing. Um, Medvedev himself has said that a top-down approach has failed. Um, and um, 
So the real question is, how do you get a bottom-up approach? And how do you look at these recommendations? And how do you get people to actually take the initiative? And does the present system allow you to do this? And you know, if someone else had said this, people would have been shocked. But Medvedev said you know, that practically no changes in the technological level of the economy have taken place. Listen to this. Technological parks, various tech transfer centers, the Russian venture companies, special economic zones, all of this primarily, to tell the truth, exists only on paper. This is the president of Russia. This is not a critic of the system. Um, so the report talks about opportunities, my last point. I think what it really is talking about is missed opportunities. Um, and the question is, will Russia be more likely to use the present situation to make changes that it was unwilling to uh, make earlier? One hypothesis is the worse the better. If oil prices stay low, the answer is yes. Another is Medvedev is going to do it. It's just going to take time. And that we, maybe that's true. We just don't know. Another is that the changes that we get are going to maximize political control and stability, or they're going to be unpredictable. We don't know that. So I think um, you know the last point um, I would make is that the report is entitled Lean Russia, but um, we're entering a period of uncertainty. And um, I think we should pay a lot of attention to the recommendations here, because what we don't want is when we're done at the end of the day to have not a lean Russia, but a mean Russia. Thank you, Toby. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, first, let me start by reciting some economic statistics. And then I'm going to relate a few observations <clears throat> about the structural impediments to increasing productivity in Russia. But before that, I just want to note that the Russian stock market is currently the single top performing stock market in the world year to date, and that the Russian government is still the world's third largest holder of official reserves. So please take any comments this afternoon with that in mind. Russia remains a very confusing and enigmatic place in which to invest and to do business. Now, last week's economic statistics tell a very ugly story about the real economy in Russia. Industrial production declined by a record 17.1% in May, with the greatest reduction in manufacturing, which declined 23.7% in May, only slightly lower than the decline of 25% in April. Real GDP declined 9.8% in the first quarter, worse than predicted, and most estimates are that GDP will decline around 11% this year, including the expectation of a resurgent oil price. So even with the near doubling of the price of oil since March to over $70 a barrel <clears throat> and a 35% depreciation in the ruble, the real economy simply does not appear to have recovered. Now, this suggests that much of the relatively strong GDP growth since 2000 in Russia was not the result of a new economic model, as you certainly just heard, or even simply the result of high oil and gas prices. But actually, I would say that there's a significant component of that, which is the result of a 40 to 45 percent annual growth in domestic credit coming from a highly inefficient and underdeveloped banking sector. I want to focus on the banking sector for just a moment because the effort by the authorities to devalue the ruble and to use reserves to do so involved the paying down of over $100 billion of foreign denominated debt by and through Russian banks. And last week, we saw the Russian government announce a new plan to recapitalize the banking sector. And these actions may have saved the banking sector, but a solvent banking sector does not mean it is a functional banking sector. And one of the impacts of the underdevelopment of the Russian banking sector is that in addition to the areas reviewed by the MGI report, I believe a major impediment to Russia's growth and development is that fundamental structural problem in the banking sector. Let me say a few words about the McKinsey Report and my own experiences in Russia, where, among other things, I once served as a director and co-chairman of the audit committee of a major Russian company. Um, the stories would be, for most of you, simply unbelievable. Uh, and thankfully, I'm restricted by confidentiality and a sense of self-preservation to uh, not tell most of them, but suffice it to say, they would blow your mind. Um, I think the McKinsey Report is to be praised for its effort to refocus the issues on the real day-to-day -day Russian economic development 
as opposed to simply market-based macro issues and the ones that usually garner attention, especially in the oil and gas and commodity-based sectors where you'll hear a lot about uh, Gazprom and the rest. In addition to the areas noted in the report and the lack of a developed financial and banking system, I think the level of political influence, the opaque and unpredictable legal system, and some very basic cultural issues are also real hallmarks of the reality of the Russian economy. While the report mentions burdensome regulations and standards, I do not think most people here in Washington can imagine just how that translates into the reality of doing business in Russia. For example, under Russian law, there is a required position in Russian corporate structure called the chief accountant. Now, this may seem like an innocuous middle management position, but actually the chief accountant is the second most important person in a Russian company. By law, he or she must report only to the CEO, and she is, he or she is the only other person allowed to sign required documents. Now, what those required documents would also blow your mind. For example, all price lists must be physically signed by the chief accountant. Every one of them. The next time you go to Russia and go to a restaurant, take a look at the menu. Because the menu is considered a price list, which means every menu needs to be signed by the chief accountant. Now translate that into running a real business and the efforts to increase productive efficiency can grind to a halt very easily if each and every rule and requirement is not followed precisely, no matter that that rule or requirement may in fact conflict with another rule or requirement. Which leads me to the concept of predictability of the legal system. When I was a director of the aforementioned company, I insisted on standard protections, a director and officer insurance, appropriate indemnities. We hired an international law firm, local lawyers, paid premiums, signed documents, and felt we had done exactly what we could do. Sometime later, a shareholder threatened to sue the board. We prepared to use those protections. Only we found the concept of indemnity doesn't exist in Russian law, so it was actually unenforceable. Similarly, the DNO insurance was called into question because, among other things, it violated the code of best practices of corporate board governance, which actually, I'm not making this up, encourages the occasional suing of board directors by both shareholders and the management to keep the board members on their toes. Another area of weakness when suing a company or shareholder in Russia, a company with 11, a country with 11 time zones, lawsuits can be filed almost anywhere, meaning that those who seek to impede your company's progress can use courts in far-flung places to tie up management for an inordinate amount of time. Now, the McKinsey Report mentions retail banking, and I wanted to tell another quick story that while it's from an earlier time, um, I want to give you a sense of how much change has already taken place in the Russian banking system and perhaps how much still has to be done. Several years ago, I was meeting with senior management of a Russian bank at a time when cash machines were just being introduced in Russia. And we were discussing the efficiencies that would result from people being able to use their time better by getting cash when they wanted it, not only when the bank was open. But the discussion became increasingly confusing because we just, they couldn't see how this was all going to work. And ultimately, we figured out that the problem was that the bank had a rule that they always had to have two people watching the ATM machines anytime they were in service and dispensing cash. So that meant they actually had to shut down the ATM machines when the bank branch was closed. Now, the McKinsey Report notes a shortage of management skills. This is huge. In most, most Russian companies that I've worked with, no one wants to take ultimate responsibility for most decisions except the CEO. And that means there is a huge embedded inefficiency of decision making, and it creates a real dearth of management expertise at the other levels of the company. In addition to the other areas mentioned about how to increase productivity in Russia, I'd add that the ability to gain from international expertise is limited by a legal system which potentially puts individuals at risk and which suffers from the perception of bias and uncertainty. Another area that shouldn't be missed is the political and somewhat convoluted nature of the, the Russian financial system, which, which all means that many companies are very skewed in how they interpret the concept of the cost of capital. And the cost of capital is a very basic metric, which in general should be used to help make investment decisions. If it costs me X to deploy my capital, then my return of capital should be at least X, plus presumably a margin above X. But in Russia, investment decisions are not always taken that way. And in fact, economic return is not always the primary or even a material part of the investment decision. And unless that changes, many parts of the economy are destined to continue operating in a highly inefficient manner. 
Some final thoughts. Russian company managements would do well to stop focusing on so much on the politics and intrigue and focus more on the reality and the management task at, at hand. An inordinate amount of senior Russian management time is spent on intrigue and politics. A clearer, more transparent environment, both within a given company and in how companies and sectors are regulated and governed, would go a long way to make things more efficient. Although I think this is probably as much cultural as anything else. Another area that bridges the macro and the micro is the fact that Russia has a very complicated anti-monopoly system. In fact, some of the country's economy is controlled by what would normally be called cartels, although they are not acknowledged as cartels. Um, we can seek competition in theory, but the reality is that these cartels create huge inefficiencies in the Russian economy. And worse, the stringent anti-monopoly laws created to address those cartels actually address the competitors to those cartels, so it's actually quite mutually uh, reinforcing on the downward pressure. I also think that Russian business environment has certain almost feudal elements to it. And by that I mean many Russian corporations can value political patronage over merit. And while there are areas where merit can be rewarded, it is less common than pure, that pure merit will be rewarded without at least some connection to the political sphere at a variety of levels. And finally, I refer to this before in a different context, but it's worth coming back to. The Russian systems, regulations, and rules are so complicated that particularly in the areas of accounting and taxation, and it extends beyond that as well, but particularly in accounting and taxation, those who understand the system can often feel threatened by potential change. And so they revert to reliance on the complexities of the system to impede that very change. Now, while I strongly agree with the desirability of a need for a lean Russia, I am sadly a bit skeptical that the country is ready to make the structural, legal, and cultural changes needed to get there, although I'm certainly hopeful that this report and these conversations will actually give a little bit of impetus to the President's initiatives in that direction. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. You all, you all were, were great. Um, um, I, I don't know if this is what you had in mind, Lenny, you know, because it's, it's sort of, even your malaise, I mean, it's an incredibly bleak picture that you've painted that, that, that to some degree needs attention. You know, if I were sitting in the CIA or defense intelligence or something, I'd be saying for those people who look at the threat, why well, you can look at Russia running for uh, uh, choke points on energy, and I suspect that to uh, 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 Toby's got a long list of things that a mean Russia could do that would be problematic for the world. But nonetheless, I mean, it does paint a picture of a, of, of a Russia that has so many internal fragilities and problems that, that one ought to not spend too much time worrying about the threat there. But what did you, I mean, just ask Lenny and your mind just real quickly before I open the floor, just very briefly, what, given the scale of problems that are out there, what, it, what beyond just trying to move Russian policymakers forward, giving them a different, what was your basic objective with this report? Because it seems the gap between the reality as it is and what you'd like to see must be one of the largest gaps of any McKinsey report of all time. I'll, I'll start in your shed. So um, what, in the first instance, if you're going to solve a problem, you've got to agree on its root causes. So firstly, what we're trying to do is just get a, a reasonably objective and well-shared view about what's going on. And its, its audience is intended both to be in Russia and around the world. And it's intended, we believe, be, as uh, we talked about, that there is a major opportunity for those who have the capitalist interest to do something about it, to actually, of their own volition, make some things happen. Now, there's a whole set of institutional mechanisms that will make that difficult in other settings, but there is a, a major uh, business opportunity associated with a lot of what we're talking about, aside from, in, in, in addition to the, the political and regulatory challenges. But you want to talk a little about what the reception's been? And um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe, maybe I think the, the objective in launching upon the exercise itself was to contribute to the public debate, um, it, it, which uh, uh, to, to help put some numbers on, on the table to get people aligned. I think reaction to it and findings have mostly been like, wow. It, it's kind of simple, isn't it? The, 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 but, but it's amazing because we're always trying to kind of come up with some very complicated solution to our, you know, eternal Russian kind of problems and barriers, whereas it's actually just about how we organize ourselves in the workplace a lot of times. I think uh, the point you're making about management culture, it, it, it's very, people said, wow, it's right in front of us, in a way, a lot of these opportunities. So I think the reaction has been um, 
uh, generally quite positive. I think some people have said uh, uh, that, uh, you know, things are more bleak. Some people have said that things are actually more positive. Uh, but what mostly people have said is that it actually means we just have to do our homework. But do the Russians go to a place like, I was just in Shenzhen, China, where the central business district of Shenzhen and those skyscrapers were built in the last five years. It's stunning to see what the Chinese have done in an incredible amount of time. And these are fellow travelers ideologically, or used to be, uh, uh, still pretend to be. Do, do the Russians freak out when they go to Shenzhen? No, I think they quite enjoy it. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Let me open the floor. We have any questions? We have we have Dominic. Let's go, let's go here, and then we'll go to Dominic or Dimitri. Excuse me. Hi, uh, my name is Molly O'Neill. I uh, served in the U.S. Embassy in the economic section back in the middle of the decade, and uh, still follow Russia closely. And I want to congratulate you on the report. I, I like the report in that it's it, it's it's sort of a. Uh, not so normative. In other words, it's it's saying some very important things, but without um, without a, a sort of saying, oh, yeah. it's such a bad. You know what I mean? It's not so judgmental, and I think that makes it go down easier. And I think you are making the important points. Uh, actually, I have sort of a question. You know, is that I think it's very important to contextualize what you're saying about Russia. In other words, when people say, okay, the state is growing, of course it is relative to where it was, state sector, but. I think it's very important to remember sort of compared to what. So I was just wondering, does anybody have a sense of how big is the state corporate, or, or is the contribution of state corporations to the GDP, you know, as a share? And is that way out of line with, say, European uh, norms? Because when I also did a lot, lived in France, know a lot about France, and frankly, you know, statism is not invented in Russia. This is a form of sort of a uh, European, possibly, it could be optimistically construed as not being so out of line with what has been European history. I, you know, uh, admittedly, most Europeans have sort of gotten over it and decided that wasn't a good approach, but is there some, I mean, is it really so out of line? That's basically yeah, what I'm Yeah, so asking. size of state sector examples, historical examples. Well, maybe just a couple numbers. Um, that particular one I'd have to look up. Uh, tax, the tax burden as a share of GDP is in, uh, was around 42, 44 percent, something like that. I think so maybe some will correct me on that. The U.S. is lower. Uh, some European countries are at that level. So that, that's a proxy a little bit for, you know, the, the state. I think one, uh, Russia, as many of you I think are, are mentioning, there's kind of there's two twists on the whole Russia story, right? There's the there's the statements of the Putin and Medvedev and 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 the statements. For example, people came to Putin and said, "Can we try to consolidate the whole airline industry, please?" And he said, "We don't need another Soviet Aeroflot. No." That's kind of the liberal part. But on the other hand, you know, the people who have linkages to maybe uh, state officials are the ones that get to run part of the competitors. At this point, I think is an important one that there's there's players. That are kind of competitive, but, but there might be might be a bit of a cartel in the oil industry. I mean, if you think about it, most oil producers in the world have one state-owned company. Actually, I mean, because you have you know all the Arabs and the Norwegians now have one. Um, I, I would don't count Exxon, BP, and Shell as global. So it's yes, the, some of them are state, some of them remain private, and in in private conversations, people, some of the private oil company owners have been told, "We're not going to take you over." Partially because we know that if the oil price declines, your companies will be among the more effective ones in actually getting the oil out of the ground. So in that, in that sense, the, the, you know, I'll have to get back to you on the exact share, but there's, in quite a lot of the sectors, it, there is um, a large share of uh, private capital. Uh, certainly, for example, uh, banking. On the one hand, Sberbank, huge. So therefore, between VTB and Sberbank, it's almost all state-owned. On the other hand, uh, you know, you have a lot of international private banks actually competing for Russian customers and winning share. So it's not, to me, this massive, from what we see, a massive uh, increase. But of course, the, this economic uh, situation today, as and I think someone mentioned, as in America, it is increasing the degree to which governments are economic actors. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, did maybe. you want to add to that? No. Toby? I did. Um, I think you have to, first of all, distinguish between state corporations, which are totally state-run, and then state-controlled corporations, the gas firms of the world, which are not, uh, you know, they're private uh, people own shares, and, and there's a difference there. So I, I think, um, you know, um, 
you have to look at that. And it's the state corporations, which is a new form where the state is the only owner and has taken, like, uh, uh, Ross Technologia, which is 500 diverse companies all of a sudden under one roof, and you kind of ask, why are they there? And then you realize some of them are defense companies. And in any country, um, the state will support a defense company even if it doesn't make money because it's an important part of the country. So people of the economy, people have to decide that. I think the difference, and, and this is where the context is really important, is that it's not a question of a percent because in a European country surrounding that state sector is a free press, our institutions, our labor unions, our competing forces, which will keep pressure on that sector, and if it really gets out of line, we'll be able to um, uh, talk about it and perhaps um, uh, uh, you know, make it function a little bit better. So I, I think, you know, if we, if we get into the numbers game, it really doesn't tell you that much. It really is a question of what are the institutions. And I think this is some of the points that you make in your report about the, the business community taking responsibility for what they do and, and uh, uh, a willingness to do that, and then the, bu the bureaucrats and how you, you handle that. So I think you have to think of it that way. You have a quick Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to pick up on th this blurring of distinction between state companies and not that. I tried to use the phrase cartel, and, and I think what I was trying to get at is, I mean, there can be two or three competitors in a sector. One of them is, quote, state-owned, and the other two are not. And yet, uh, at the top levels of strategic decision-making, uh, you would be very hard-pressed to say that those two, quote, competitors are not driven by the same political agenda as the one which is technically state-owned. So I'd caution them. Which has better distance. access to capital? Uh, that, that depends. I mean, you look at a company like Gazprom, and Gazprom traditionally plays a unique role in its access to capital. Having said that, uh, it itself has had some problems in access and capital of late because they overextended. Mm. Um, but to say that it's, it's somehow less able to finance itself more cheaply than a, quote, private sector alternative, first of all, in Russia there's no such thing, really. And, and second of all, um, these are, are really moving parts. But clearly a standalone, free market-based, unimpeded by the state company in Russia theoretically ought to have cheaper access to capital, and it doesn't. Dmitry Novik. Uh, my name is Dmitry Novik. I have some privilege. I uh, live in Russia 57 years, so it's a lot. So I have some experience. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the forest among the trees, because it's a lot of numbers, but what's the basic problem from Russia today? We know it's real life, it's so many factors in players, but what's the main factors, uh, political or social? or cultural, or educational, or, okay. or humane thing. So my question is this. What is your opinion? What's the main reason that Russia cannot do what potentially she can? Thank you. Your mind? <laughs> well, this report was around uh, the productivity of sectors. So uh, I cannot comment or from this on culture and politics. And, and I would say from the areas we investigated here, the biggest problem is lack of experience. This is experience from history. It is experience of alternative examples. Uh, it is experience of actually doing it already. And a little bit of this being kind of stuck in trying to think which way do we really need to push? I think that's actually in the business community, and I think colleagues mentioned a lot of things in the context that are very important. But from what we surveyed, it's the lack of experience. Uh, oh, right here. Can I follow up? I, I, I believe we've got eight minutes, and so the answer is no. We'll, we'll do it after it. Yes. Uh, Vlad Prokapa from CSIS. Thank you for thank you for the very interesting conversation here. Um, there's actually a lot of U.S. Western companies that uh, work in Russia now, and uh, they're all posting high profits and high growth rates. So they're doing they're in very good shape. Um, so I'm wondering, does this expertise of those Western companies in Russia 
spill over to the Russian companies that work in Russia. And what can be done, what should the government do to encourage this process? So the Russian uh, companies that work in Russia can actually learn from the experience of the uh, American and Western companies that are working in Russia now. It's a Thank good you. question. You either can take it as there osmosis between different firms working in different ways, or is there you know, a sufficient level of corporate theft and uh, mimicking <laughs> that... Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take the first angle. The, the, I think it, there is examples. Take the telecom sector. Um, the companies there have very modern uh, methods. They have a lot of the guys who are working there are educated in the West. I, th I think that industries that came to life from zero after the 1990s have a very different feel to those that carry an asset base. Uh, what can Russia do? Well, they all, again, as usual, we, we, we've named all the things that the, the policymakers named them. Uh, encourage maybe more intensively English language education from the st starting primary education. Uh, probably, it's a mutual thing, but it would be great if Russia and other countries had more uh, mutual travel and you know, easier, uh, easier visa rules. Um, but I think it, it, welcoming international experts to come to Russia and work, absolutely key. Any other comments? I, yes, sir. I absolutely oh, agree. I, I, the Russian companies um, uh, um, have um, done an awful lot, especially if they want to raise capital in the West. There is no way they can do it by just saying, you know, trust me. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you just, um, uh, they That's have just learned how to operate in the West, and they've hired a lot of people, and uh, a lot of them know what, what has, to, uh, has to be done. And I would just stress the point that where there's no Soviet hangover, uh, telecoms, even some IT, um, uh, you find um, the most uh, innovative um, companies. And it's almost, um, I think, down the line. Doug, quick. Yeah, uh, first of all, the sector in which I was um, on the board was the telecom sector. So I just want to put a little bit of cold water on the fact that this is somehow, you know, um, uh, Silicon Valley on the, uh, in, in Moscow. Um, yeah, um, but let, let me just, uh, you know, somebody talked about uh, raising capital. Um, if you read a prospectus for a Russian company, um, be prepared to be shocked because most people don't read it because if they did, they would never invest because there's 20 or 30 pages in every capital raising document that comes out of a Russian company that tells you why you would be insane to do so. <laughs> it's, it's a risk factor section that is you know, the size of a small paperback novel. People skip over it, they want to be part of it, they'll invest. So it is very sentiment driven, the capital inflows and outflows in Russia. It's not necessarily because the fundamentals are driven by management shifts which would mirror those in the West. Yes, sir. <clears throat> And it's Bergen Keeney, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, I was struck by the discontinuity, in a sense, between the comments that Gotti and Redica made of the problems of graft and <coughs> capital flight and other illegal aspects. And I wondered, uh, to, my question is really to Princess Olsenitsyn, uh, to what extent uh, do those problems skew your analysis as to productivity by sectors or totality? And I ask for two reasons. Uh, uh, how does that affect your calculations of productivity? And two, to what extent does it suggest a way that they can in fact double it if they do uh, close off these uh, leakages in the system? But so in other words, how, how important are these criticisms of the Russian operation in making any rational assessment of its uh, effectiveness? Good question. Thanks, um, Bert. Yes, thank you for the question. Well, uh, first, it, it doesn't skew because it's in the numbers. So, so the numbers of Russian productivity uh, reflect all the factors, including these factors of graft, administrative barriers, and so on that companies have to deal with. Um, in terms of moving towards a target of improving these numbers, um, as we said, foremost, uh, uh, you know, enhancing competition, uh, true competition, uh, competition which is not just in the marketplace but also absence of, let's say, favoritism in bureaucracies is the number one recommendation to, to the government. Um, but uh, it, it's certainly part of the challenge um, that exists as well as many of the other challenges we talked about, such as managerial culture, such as reporting uh, guidelines, such as various other uh, 
other factors that exist, but it is in the numbers. Uh, Norman? I think it's Thank you, We're Norman Bailey, Institute of World Politics. I was uh, chief economist on the staff of the National Security Council towards the end of the Soviet period. At that time, uh, Soviet uh, economic and financial statistics came in two flavors, useless and misleading on purpose. Um, <laughs> Are the Russian economic and financial statistics at this point uh, fairly decent? I mean, in other words, or is it garbage in, garbage out when you try to an analyze them? Uh, you know, I, I, I can't say that the statistics I cited uh, that I have firsthand knowledge as to how accurate they are, but I think that um, they're certainly not in the category of what they were at the time that you're speaking of. And uh, I, I would say they are certainly no more or less um, misleading than certain other very large emerging markets that are considered um, very, very hot destinations for capital these days. So I, I don't know if it's an accurate reflection of the Russian economy. I don't believe it's affirmatively misleading. And I think that there's enough transparency in the Russian economy and there's enough outside metrics in which you can kind of compare and contrast that if it was really off base, you'd know. I mean, you can tell if electrical consumption is, you know, one way, and yet they're showing statistics that show another, that there's a gap, and I haven't heard that, that people are finding that. I mean, I was very moved, just, just before we go to your mind, but, but by what Toby Gatti uh, reported, um, the Medvedev saying and acknowledging, that's not something you sort of often hear, say, in the Chinese case, where you see, you know, rampant growth and whatnot, but nonetheless, you feel uh, that if they ever sort of hit a speed bump somewhere, there would be a political cost in admitting it, which creates a culture of I think obfuscation, lies, et cetera, and, and the kind of garbage environment on data that, that Norman referred to. But Yermelai, what do you think? Yeah, go, go ahead, Toby, and then Yermelai. I just want uh, to say that I think that if, uh, the finance, if the crisis were to get much worse, the data would become a little, they'd be a little more loose on it. You know, as the reserves started getting around $400 billion, That's what so, they No, I, I'm saying, but as they went, 600 you said, okay, 600 in the bank, 500 probably 500 got to 400 and you kept, said to yourself, uh, not so sure. Maybe it's really 350. You know. So I, I think when there are problems, people tend to do this. But um, I needn't remind anybody who's reading the U.S. newspapers that we do that, the same. That the numbers <laughs> that we've heard from some of our corporations leave a lot to be desired. It's uh, um, uh, it, it's just that um, uh, you know there's no other way of finding out this, and there's no way of remedying it. Once you find it out, there's just, just a quick comment. On the numbers in our report, we went very bottom up. So what we did is we actually went into corporate statistics or we went to interviews. We even sometimes did time measurements for uh, the time it takes. So mm -hmm. these numbers are actually uh, very disconnected from any official state statistics mm -hmm. to, to the veracity of which I cannot comment, but I think there's. Interesting. Yes, and we'll take last question from this lady here. Um, well, you wait for the microphone to get to you. Hi, my name is Patricia. Um, I'm not really sure um, who said it, but Someone said that the average lifespan of a man is 59 years old. Um, what's being done to fix that? I know that there's like a lot of alcoholism problems, suicide rates. What's being done to fix that cultural legacy so that you have a workforce that's physically and mentally okay so that you can actually work and live past 59? It's not your objective in your study to make people live longer, but do you have any thoughts on it, Yermolai? Uh, as I'm sure that my colleagues here would, but my thoughts are, first of all, not enough. Um, there, have, there have been, let's say, initiatives launched, again, perhaps on paper, uh, but things around sports and the importance of that. Uh, uh, they are considering drastically increasing the price of uh, cigarettes uh, and banning smoking in public places like in America, but it's still only kind of bills that have not been passed, and it's, it's a bit strange. I mean, even if Italians were able to ban smoking in public places, I, mean, I don't know. But, but I mean, theoretically we will. Um, the, uh, there's been you know, ambulances bought and, and money put into some clinics, but the culture of this healthy living, it takes a long time to build up and, and it's a whole set, set of things that need, needs, needs to um, take place. A lot of it is, again, awareness. Uh, Doug? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, to take this to a slightly uh, related and unrelated issue, but it's relate, raised in the McKinsey report, which is demographics. Um, do not underestimate the impact of demographic change in Russia as an economic, but also as a very political issue. Um, and keep your eye on the Russian Far East that borders China, because you've got a dearth of men who are living past a certain age, who are not terribly productive, uh, bordering a country 
that has a one child, the legacy of a one child policy with an abundance of men. There's a huge inflow of Chinese uh, element uh, in, in certain parts of Russia coming over the border as a result of some of these demographic shifts. So while it's not directly in relation to the question you're asking, um, even if the issue is not front and center on certain people's minds now, which I believe it is, uh, you're going to see some broad strategic shifts as a result of the demographics. They're going to uh, result in a lot of interesting dynamics and changes. Toby, did you want to add one thing? Last well, comment. Um, if beer is not considered an alcoholic beverage, um, you can imagine um, what the attitude is towards uh, you know, the consumption of alcohol. We don't have to imagine. It's part of the culture, but it's also important. Um, tax money comes from cigarettes, comes from alcohol. A lot of this is um, uh, connected uh, with revenue. And um, it's very expensive uh, to build the kind of health facilities that are needed. I mean, I think, I, I'm not sure if it's 45% or 50% of the hospitals in Russia don't have hot water. And um, so, you know, uh, when, we, when we have our debates, you know, you have to keep in mind that you're really talking about um, uh, a country that has just not invested uh, in, its, its, in its people, although people are starting to understand that's your main natural resource. And it's not the energy in the ground, it's the people, um, as long as they stay above the ground, let's put it that way. Um, so I, I, I think that that, that is changing, but um, it's just going to take a really long time. And if you remember the last campaign against alcohol, that was under Gorbachev, and everybody laughed. But in point of fact, the um, life expectancy of males went up three, four years within a very short period of time. So this is not this is something that's amenable uh, to change. You just have to want to do it. You also have to have a diet that um, is is better than what the um, average uh, diet is that people can afford. This reminds me of the old days when Norman Bailey was talking before when Murray Feshbach was out looking and measuring infant mortality and got, finding other measures to look at at the performance of the the, the real Russian economy at that time. So on that wonderfully optimistic note, let me thank Lenny Mendonca, Yermolai Solzhenitsyn, Toby Gatti, and Doug Redeker for sharing very, very interesting thoughts on this important new McKinsey report, which you can download from the New America Foundation website, I'm sure the McKinsey website, right, uh, and the Washington Note. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And I should also say that one hour from now, for those of you who are interested and who are still watching online, uh, we are going to have, there, there is a major and interesting rift inside New America Foundation v among a, a lot of talented people. I happen to be one of the less talented but opinionated who are going to be discussing the Iran Iranian election. So uh, please feel free to join us if you'd like. Yes.